ways to the book of John, the Gospel of John, <clears throat> in chapter 3. The Gospel of John, in chapter 3, this well-known scripture, this well-known story uh, in the great Gospel of John, chapter 3. And if you haven't a Bible, just listen carefully as I read this lovely story down. John chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. We know that God will bless the reading of his word <coughs> tonight. <coughs> when we come to the Gospels, when God comes to tell us about his Son, he uses four men, four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four different men in very different ways, different jobs, different occupations. But God uses these four special men to tell us about his son, the gospel writers. And each of these particular gospel writers present the person of Christ, the work of Christ, in a different way. Matthew, we all know, is the gospel of the king. You see, that's where Matthew starts his gospel. These are the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And so he points right in the very first verse, he points the great kingly line, uh, the King David. Those that were here this morning, we thought about David. And so Matthew is a gospel of the king. And then Mark is a gospel of the servant, because Mark was a servant. He was a servant that failed. He ran away. But, uh, of course, the Lord Jesus was a servant who never failed. Didn't Isaiah say that in his prophecy? My servant, men elect, he shall not fail. And, and, and he didn't fail. And more importantly, he couldn't fail. And so Matthew is a gospel of the king. Mark is a gospel of the servant. Luke is a gospel of the son of man. And the great key verse in the gospel, gospel of Luke is in chapter 19 and verse 10 when the Lord Jesus was in the house of Zacchaeus, you remember how he said that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so Luke is the gospel of the Son of Man. But when you come to John, John is the gospel of the Son of God. And John portrays the Lord Jesus time after time exactly just as it is as the Son of God. And the gospel of John is a wonderful gospel because I think... Uh, uh, as I read the Gospel of John, that it's the Gospel of the individual. You'll notice as you flick through the chapters of John and as you study the chapters of John, the time after time, the Lord Jesus deals with people on a personal basis. In chapter 1, he calls his disciples one by one, Peter and Andrew. 
James and John and so on. And then in chapter 2, he deals with people individually at the wedding at Cana of Galilee. In chapter 3, he deals with Nicodemus that we're going to look at tonight. In chapter 4, he deals with a woman at a well in Samaria in the middle of the day. In chapter 5, he deals with a man at the pool of Siloam. In chapter 6, he, he deals with a little boy. Even though there's thousands of people there, there's one little boy brought out just five loaves and two fish. We all remember the story, the feeding of the 5,000. And so when we come to John chapter 3, where we've come to tonight, the Lord Jesus speaks an individual. And his name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus one night long ago. One of her brethren prayed that in a prayer meeting tonight. Really encouraged me. And so on to the pages of Scripture comes a man called Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus was a unique man. Nicodemus was an authority in the city of Jerusalem. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the council. In fact, it, it wasn't even the council. It was, it was more. It was a, a, he was a member of the government in Jerusalem at that particular time. Nicodemus. I suppose if we honed it down to, to our days, it would be like one of our MLAs or something like that. We'll talk no more about that tonight. Three times Nicodemus is mentioned in John's Gospel. He's mentioned in chapter 3, he's mentioned in chapter 7, and he's mentioned in chapter 19. In chapter 3, he's in the city. In chapter 7, he's in the council. And in chapter 19, he's at the cross. In chapter 3, we see his, his uh, desire. His desire is that he comes to see the Lord Jesus. In chapter 7, he's in the council. And that's his defense. In those verses in chapter 7, they begin to talk about the Lord. And Nicodemus steps to the front and he defends Christ. His desire, his defense. And then in chapter 19, he's at the cross. And that's his devotion. We'll see that before we finish tonight. Nicodemus was a man of rank in Jerusalem. He's a man of responsibility in Jerusalem. He was a man of respectability in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, if we're going to just imagine him, we could see him walking about. He would have been well-dressed in, in robes and perhaps one of those even turbans on his head. And he would have been walking, busying himself through the streets of Jerusalem day by day. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a busy man. And so this particular night, in John chapter 3, he comes to see Jesus. Now, why did he come to see Jesus by night? Now, that's a big question, isn't it? And all these theologians and commentaries have all the different ideas. Some say he come to Jesus by night because there's a, there's a phrase used in John's gospel for fear of the Jews. Uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish system, and perhaps some think that he come to Nic to come, Nicodemus came to Jesus this night because he was afraid of the Jews. It doesn't say that about Nicodemus, by the way. People think it does, but it doesn't. And then others think, well, he come because uh, he was busy during the day. He sat in the, in the Sanhedrin, he sat in the council, he sat in the government. And so he would have been very busy. People would have been queuing to see him. And maybe he came by night because he was busy during the day. Maybe. Derek Bingham in his book said this, I thought it was good. He says, maybe Nicodemus came by night because this particular night, because he couldn't wait the next morning. There was just a real burning in his soul, a real desire in his heart in John chapter 3, and he just had to come this particular night. And when he came, the Gospel of John records this great conversation between Nicodemus and our Lord Jesus. And so tonight what I want to do with the moments that are left as time goes on very quickly, I want to think about three, sorry, four lessons that Nicodemus learn this particular night. Four lessons that Nicodemus learned from the Lord this particular night. Now, the first lesson Nicodemus learned was this. Lesson number one this night, he learned, he learned number one lesson, the lesson of the womb, the lesson of the womb. Now, I want you to think tonight about this great lesson, the lesson of the womb. Here's the lesson Verse number three, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a great lesson. It's the lesson of the womb tonight. You see, this gave Nicodemus great trouble. You know, it's all right for you and me. We have been born and where we're born in Ulster. And, and we know about being saved. We know what it is to be born again. Those of us that went to Sunday school and those of us that were brought to the meeting and the church services from where we were children. And we listened to preachers and they all talked about being born again and being saved. But the Lord Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you see, Nicodemus' brain began to work. Nicodemus said, but how can a man be born again, Lord? And, and he says, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You see, Nicodemus right away went to the natural birth. The natural birth. There was a time each of us were born. The moment our mothers gave birth to us, our life began, isn't that right? Well, it didn't really. It began nine months before that. But the moment that we were born, our mothers conceived us, our birth day. And that's where Nicodemus went back to. He says, can a man enter into his mother's womb again and be born? And how did Jesus answer him? And Jesus says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's what the Lord said. That was not your birth. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. We were all born naturally. But the Lord was telling Nicodemus he must be born spiritually. And you see, Nicodemus thought, but Nicodemus was a religious man. Nicodemus probably, in fact, I have no doubt that he knew the first five books of the Bible. When the Jewish boys were 12 years of age, they were brought to the temple in Jerusalem. And there they were learned the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. It's very possible that Nicodemus could have started at Genesis chapter 1 and quoted those five books of the Bible off by heart. That's what the boys were taught in the temple. The Torah, the first five books. And he was religious, and he was a member of the government, and he was rich. But yet he must be born again. That's a great lesson of the womb, you know. We must be born again. You see, tonight on this globe on which we live, there's seven billion people. And every one of them has two things in common. The first thing is this, that they're all sinners. That's a great lesson of the womb. We are all sinners. We were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity, in sin, that our mothers conceive us. Each of us, the moment we're born, we're born in sin, we inherit sin. Because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, before, because he partaken of that fruit that God had told him not to do. Well, then the great curse and the great conflict of sin is passed upon the human race. And each of us tonight in this meeting and in Kilkeel tonight of this in common, we're all sinners. You're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Spurgeon said that the foot of the cross was level ground. When we come to the cross of Calvary, each of us come the same. We come as a sinner. That's a great lesson of the womb tonight. We must be born again. You see, in Adam all die, and each of us, our first parents in the Garden of Eden, each of us have inherited sin and death from them. So in Adam all die, but so in Jesus Christ all shall be made alive. That is the great lesson of the womb. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the first lesson is the lesson of the womb. Here's the second lesson, verse 8. Look at it. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. 
So is every one that is born of the Spirit of God. Lesson number one, the lesson of the womb. Lesson number two, the Lord taught Nicodemus, the lesson of the wind, the lesson of the wind. Now, it sounds complicated in verse 8, but it's not really. Let's break it down. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You see, <clears throat> my wife and I this afternoon, when we got something to eat, we went down to Newcastle and we parked in the car park at Donard there, and we walked to Morlock Bay. And uh, the wind was blowing. And uh, we knew the wind was blowing. We, we could feel it. Now, we can't see it, but we can feel it. The wind bloweth word listeth, listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But thou canst not tell where it cometh and where it goeth. And that's true. As we walked that beach today, when we walked towards Morlach, the wind was on our back, and I was trying to figure it out. We we're on the east coast of Northern Ireland, and the wind was coming behind us, so I assumed that it was coming from the south. And, and, and we could feel it. And there was a wee shower of rain come on, and, and, and it blew on our backs. And it wasn't too bad. And then when we went to Morlock, we turned, and we started to head back again. And when we head back again, we were walking south, and so the wind was blowing against us. And so we knew that the wind was coming from the south, but we don't know where it starts. And when you go out tonight, you can feel the effects of the wind on your body, those parts of your body tonight that are exposed, your hands, your face, your neck. You can feel the wind, but you can't see it. And, and you don't know where it starts, and, and you don't know where it finishes. That's what the verse tells us. So is every one that is born of the Spirit of God. That's a great lesson of the wind. And those of us that are saved, the moment that we get saved, the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt our very being, our very soul. At the moment of conversion, when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, when your sins are washed away, that day that you were converted, that day that you were born again, the Holy Spirit came. The hymn writer said, as soon as all I've entered on the life-giving blood, the Holy Spirit entered, and I was born of God. And the Holy Spirit comes, and it indwells himself in our very being. Oh, do you remember that scripture tonight? Do you know that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Mind you, when you think about that, I thought about it today. As I was walking up the beach, how my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And those of us Christians in the meeting tonight, let's remember that the Holy Spirit is in our lives. And, and, and we see it's a fact in our lives. And when we sin and when we do wrong, there's a great consciousness that comes to us. That's the Holy Spirit. Our consciences are pricked. We know that we've done wrong. We know that we've sinned. That's a great lesson of the wind. We can feel the unction of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 reminds us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit by our actions. One of the terrible thing for our lives and the way we behave ourselves and, and the way we conduct ourselves, that, that it's possible that we could grieve the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit. And what Christians we are ought to be. And the Lord was was describing to Nicodemus about the great work of the Spirit of God, the lesson of the wind. Lesson number one, the lesson of the wind. Lesson number two, the lesson of the wind. Lesson number three is the lesson of the wilderness. Now, this is good. Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. You see, the Lord Jesus, you know, he really was the Prince of Preachers. And the Lord would have knew that Nicodemus would have knew these books at the beginning of the Old Testament. And so what he does on this occasion is that he brings them to Numbers chapter 21. 
And he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And so this is a story that Nicodemus would have knew. And right away, Nicodemus' brain kicks into gear, and he remembers that story that he read when he was just a boy about, Nic about Moses and about the serpent in the wilderness. And when we turn our pages of our Bible to Numbers chapter 21, we read of how the children of Israel were in, in the desert. Remember how they came from Egypt and how the great promise was to go to Cain in that land flowing with milk and honey. And they left Egypt that night by the blood of the Lamb. Remember how the door posts and the lintel was to be sprinkled by the blood on the great promise of God, Jehovah, to Moses was this, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that angel of death passed through the land of Egypt that night, and, and those people left the land of Egypt, one and a half million of them, and they come to the Red Sea, and, and God parted the Red Sea, and they went over in dry land, and then they, they head into the desert, into the wilderness. And, and, and you know, their hearts continually sin against God time after time, and 40 years is spent in the wilderness. And the Numbers chapter 21, you know what happened? The, the people that come to Moses and they say, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're fed up. They, they had no patience, and they had no gratitude. And, and they said, you know, listen, every morning we get up, this bread, this manna, you know what they said? They said, we're, we're sick eating this manna. Every morning when they come out, the bread was on the grass, and, and they went and they lifted it, and they fed angel food. And, and they said to Moses, would be better back in Egypt making bricks? At least when we were back in Egypt, we had garlic and onion. It wasn't much of a dad, he thought anyway, garlic and onion, but anyway. With garlic and onions back in Egypt, and, and we're sick eating this bread. And you know, God's wrath was kindled against them again. And he sent fairy serpents into the wilderness. And, and they bit the people. And many of them died. And then they realized that they'd done wrong, and they come back to Moses, and they say, Moses, we're sorry for, sorry for our sin, and we're sorry for speaking against God. And Moses went, and he, he pleaded on behalf of the people. And, and God told Moses, take the brass from the camp and melt it down, and, and make a, a serpent and put it on a pole. And, and set it up. And here was the promise. He said, God says to Moses, when someone's bit by the serpent, tell them to look and live. Look and live. And the Lord Jesus was telling Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And Nicodemus knew the story of how that serpent had been carved, how it was set up on the pole, and how when they looked, they lived. And what Jesus was doing was he was pointing to a few months ahead, that day when he would be lifted up on the cross, and 2,000 years later in the great day of grace and the great day of salvation, nothing has changed. And if you're a sinner in the meeting tonight, all you have to do at the cross is to look and you live. Look to Jesus where he won. Look and live. Look and live. That's the lesson of the wilderness. Look and live. You know, <clears throat> at this great part in this story, I believe that Nicodemus got saved right here. Verse 14, verse 15, verse 16. I have no doubt about that. You see, when the Lord died on the cross in John chapter 19, when he cried, we remembered it this morning as we sat at the table, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he dismissed his spirit. John tells us that when that happened, that there was two men arrived on that scene. One of them was a man called Joseph of Arimathea. Now, Arimathea was 25 miles from Jerusalem. But God had put it in the heart of Joseph to buy a tomb 25 miles from his home. He was a rich man. And of course, that was a, a prophecy being fulfilled because Isaiah said that he was with the rich in his death. 
And so Joseph of Arimathea appears at Calvary, and along with him comes Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And what a job they have. Can you see them taking the cross? Perhaps the Roman soldiers lift the cross with the dead body of the Lord upon it. You can't see them setting it down too easy now, can you? After all they've done. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come and they take the crown of thorns from off his head and they take the nails out of his hands and out of his feet and they wash the body of the Lord quietly, reverently. And I wonder, as Nicodemus does that, does he remember these words in John chapter 3? Perhaps as he takes the crowd of thorns from off the Saviour's brow, perhaps as he looks down at the cross, at the blood-stained cross that Brian and Ruth have sang about tonight, wonder does he think as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that's the lesson of the wilderness the lesson of the wind the lesson of the wind the lesson of the wilderness as I finish tonight the last great lesson is the lesson of the whosoever. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. What a lesson it is. What a great word whosoever is. Whosoever means and includes everybody it excludes nobody. Tonight in Kilkeel Baptist Church, I want to tell you that you are in the great whosoever. The seven billion people in the world tonight are in the great whosoever. And those that ever have lived in the world tonight have been in the great whosoever. There's power in Jesus' blood to cleanse from all sin. All will not be saved, but there's power in the blood of Christ, and there's more in the sacrifice of Calvary for salvation for everyone. That's the great whosoever tonight. What a saviour we we'll have tonight. What a saviour is presented to you tonight. And the great whosoever of the gospel tonight goes out. Your pastor tonight stands in Billy Baptist Church just now, and he's preaching the gospel. And you know what he's doing? He's preaching the same whosoever. And in our own church in Lurgan, our brother is standing up tonight and he's telling the same story and he's preaching tonight the great whosoever of the gospel. And I have been in India and have told the boys and girls in India the great story of the whosoever. And I've been in Uganda standing under the trees to keep the sun off and those little boys and girls sat on the grass and I told them the same story about the whosoever. Whosoever believeth on him. It's not whosoever prayeth and whosoever payeth or whosoever worketh. It's whosoever believeth. That's it. It's simple to me. Whosoever believeth on him. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That's wonderful tonight, isn't it? The great message, the great lesson of the whosoever. And yet, you know, <clears throat> as we finish our meeting tonight, this great word, whosoever, is found in the last chapter, but one in our Bible in Revelation chapter 20. And there it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever. And I want to tell you tonight, solemnly as our meeting finishes, 
that if you leave the scene of time and have entrusted Christ as your Savior, because it's what we do with Jesus in our human lifetime that determines our destiny for eternity. And if you leave the seed of time and have entrusted Christ, well, then hell will be your portion. Because whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever. But tonight we live in the great day of grace. And tonight there's room and time and there's opportunity for you tonight in this meeting to be saved. And it's just calling upon God. And it's just coming to the cross, to Calvary, just like Nicodemus did. And just as you come to Calvary by the eyes of faith tonight and see that blessed man hanging upon the cross with nails in his hands and feet for you and a crown of thorns upon his brow. And on that cross alone, he bore the great price of sin. In three hours of light and in three hours of darkness. And in those hours of darkness, he cried, May God, may God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that you and I would not be forsaken forever. And because you and I tonight are in the great whosoever of the gospel tonight, we can come and we can come to the cross and we can come just with our sin. And you can just say, Jesus, I will trust thee. And I'll trust thee with my soul. And I'm guilty and I'm lost and I'm helpless. But you can make me whole. I wonder would someone take that step tonight as your meeting finishes. The lesson of the wind. The lesson of the wind. The lesson of the wilderness and the lesson of the whosoever. May God give you courage to take that step tonight. Let's pray. Now just in the quiet moments of the meeting as it finishes tonight, I urge you tonight that if you're in the meeting and you have had any inklings or thoughts of any of these things tonight, not to leave this church without them. Now, it's a personal thing. It's between you and God. I can't save you. If I could, I would do it. And many of the brethren and sisters in here would too. But it's Christ alone can save. And so in these moments of quietness, I urge you tonight that if you feel the, urge, the unseen of the Spirit of God at all, not to leave the meeting without him. If you want to talk to me, I'll be at the door. I'll be about for a while. They can do that. Take you to the side, take you into another room, if that's what you want. But the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. May God help you to do that tonight. Lord, we thank you tonight for the story of the gospel. We thank you for the great whosoever. We pray tonight, O God, that when the preacher's voice is silent, that God's voice will be heard. We pray that the devil's work would be defeated. We know in these moments that he comes and he tries to steal away the good seed that's been sown. That's the light of the glorious gospel would shade in. O God, defeat his work. Defeat the powers of darkness and pray this night that the voice of God will be heard in some heart. Give someone courage to take that step. Help us as we sing our closing verse and take us to our homes in safety. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.